Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank God for your patience and your time. This is our Transform You Bible study. Our Transform You Bible study, where we are hoping and praying that God uses this study of His Word to transform your life, to transform your heart, transform your mind. I was talking with our founder and good brother, um, Dr. Brian, who sends his love and wants to share his hellos to each and every one of you all. Um, this Sunday, we will be having our Holy Eucharist uh, communion, and we also will be having a baptism. This Sunday, we'll be having a baptism and immediately following service, immediately following service, we we will be we will be um, having our back to school bash, our back to school bash, where we will be in partnership with Microsoft and Peter, Atlanta Cush, um, uh, Baltimore chapter of Cap Alpha Psi Foundation and several the Steve and Marjorie Harvey Foundation, um, um, several other folk are part, partnering with us because they love Baltimore and they love ET Nation. And we're going to be giving our 500 book bags with supplies in it. Y'all heard what I said? 500 book bags with supplies in it. And we have some pretty big Microsoft. Y'all know Microsoft. I'm going to give me a Microsoft tablet now. And and Steve Harvey, my wife, loves watching Family Feud. So I, I got even more reason to watch Family Feud. And because the Steve and Marjorie Harvey Foundation is partnering with us, with us, with, with us, with us, and our Back to School Bash. And uh, Peter, our friends who love to protect our animals, uh, we're going to be providing the food that's going to be all vegan. And I promise you, you won't be able to, if I didn't tell you, you would not have known that the food will be all vegan. Um, so it's going to be a wonderful time. All for our children. We want to give out every single book bag that we have. We don't want to take any. In fact, some of you probably saw the boxes in the foyer. Those are the book bags and supplies. Uh, so please come. Please tell your children or your grandchildren or your nieces and your nephews to come. Um, we're going to have our Patrick, our audiovisual guy, we're going to make a little thank you video that we're going to send to Steve and Marjorie Harvey and Microsoft and those folks, uh, thanking them for their kindness and their contribution. So we want you all to come. I believe on Baptism Sundays, we typically wear white, but this is summer. Y'all just be appropriate whenever you wear, um, because it's going to be hot outside. Uh, we don't want y'all to leave. I need ministers. We're going to have an evangelism table. And so I'm going to need the ministers to come and man that table and just pray over the space. Um, and and, and we have, we're praying to have a hallelujah, uh, good, good time in the Lord. Um, so with those announcements being made, did I tell you that I love you today? Well, I do. I love you, Empowerment Temple. I love you dearly, and I want to thank you from the depths of heart for the wonderful expressions of birthday gifts and wishes that you rendered to your pastor. I have not received and not seen that kind of outpouring of love um, in all my years in pastoring, and I just want to thank you all from the depths of my heart. You all, I love you. I do. I do. And it's, it's, I really do love you. And, and, and as hard as it was for me to leave my 30s, it was hard. It was much better than the alternative. <laughs> and <laughs> And you all made transitioning to my 40s so easy and so sweet um, because you still make me feel young. And so I thank God for you. I thank God for you very much. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father, we pray that you bless us tonight, that you teach us, that you show us your will and your way. 
forgive us for all of our sins. We do not deserve this time in your house. We do not deserve this time in your word. We do not deserve the grace that you give us. But we thank God for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for looking beyond all of our sins and blessing us with what we need. And God, we need to hear from you. We need to feel you. We need to know you better than ever before. Teach us now in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank God. Proverbs 25, we will begin, we will begin at the sixth verse of Proverbs 25. Last week we talked about um, how we ought to remove impurities from silver. We talked about um, the wicked, removing the wicked from the presence of the people. We, we talked about how it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. We talked about it, it is also the glory of men or kings to, to find and to uncover things. Um, and on tonight, we will begin at verse 6. At verse 6 in the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, verse 6, um, and it reads, Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, come up here than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Proverbs, you know, Proverbs 25 through 29 is the book that was discovered after the Babylonian captivity. We'll read, it was discovered because they were taken away and they hadn't read the Bible in such a long time and the folks began to pray um, but here in verse 6, we see, we see the advice, the God-given advice from spoken through, spoken through God's servant, the wisest man that we know to have lived. And it tells us to not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Exalt uh, also means to praise, to praise yourself. Do not praise yourself in the presence of the king, the king, the king. And, 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 and really, 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 the king in this text, we, we know that there is only one true king. That is God Almighty. Um, we, 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 we know that. So that can be taken to mean God, but it also could be taken to mean anyone that is in authority over you, you ought not exalt yourself in their presence. So it's kind of like, we know when we pray to God, we should not exalt ourselves. But God, you know, because the Bible teaches about that, how when, when some people, when the Pharisees pray, they you know, thank God, Lord, I'm not like these other folks. I thank God that I, 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 I had my child when I was supposed to. I thank God that I, I, didn't, I didn't drink all night and smoke all night like these worldly people. I thank God that, you know, in those kind of prayers, God is not pleased with, you know, those self-righteous Thank God you didn't make the same mistakes in life as other folks did. But that's what you should do. You should, you should thank God and not yourself. Because the scripture teaches, but for the grace of God. Somebody knows about, but for the grace of God. There go who? There go I. So don't exalt yourself in your prayer life to God. Don't sit on you, don't kneel on your knees tonight or in the morning or in the midday or even over supper. Lord, I thank you that I'm able to buy this nice meal. God, I showed you a good job on this macaroni and cheese. 
Lord, I sure made this fried chicken. You know, that's a prayer exalting yourself. Lord, I thank you because ain't nobody going to cook it but me. I do it all by myself. Lord, I thank you for the strength to do it all by myself. Who is that prayer about? Who is that prayer exalting? And God looking down at you like, really? Really? You're exalting yourself in your prayers. And the Bible says in Proverbs, what chapter is this? 25. What's the verse? Say, Do not exalt yourself to who? The king. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. So when you are praying to God, you hopefully are in his presence. Hopefully. You have centered yourself in your prayer room, in your prayer closet. That is not the time to what? Exalt yourself. Lord, I woke up this morning just because I wanted to. Because I'm so good. You the first thing on my mind. God, I'm so holy and so righteous, but I live in a sinful world. That sounds, to some people, that sounds right. Now you woke up that good. I didn't do no drinking last night. I went to bed early. Because I wanted to come up early this morning and talk to you. Because God, I love you more than anybody else. Who's, who, who, this is a prayer to God, but who are you spending time exalting? Yourself. And the Bible says, Proverbs 25, what verse? Do not what? Exalt yourself in whose presence? The presence of the king. And so it's important. God wants us to pray. But it's important for us to know how to pray. And as the preacher mentioned Sunday, you know the difference between prayers and supplications. Y'all remember what the difference is? All supplications are prayers, but all prayers are not supplications. Prayers are typically when you are praising God for what God has done. That's why prayer should enter you into praise. And prayers also can include your petitions or requests. Supplications are all petitions and requests. That's why if you, if you, need, if you ever forget, remember the root word for supplications is supply. So when you're asking, so when you're giving supplications, you are asking God to supply a need. All supplications are prayers, but all prayers are not supplications. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. All right. Like all apples are fruit, but all fruit, not apples. That makes a little bit better sense. I got to put something to food to help us. You know, you got it now. All liquor is drink, but all drink ain't what? Thank God, because I need some water in my life. <laughs> and when I ask for a drink, I'm not talking about a jack. I need some water. So all supplications are prayers, but all prayers are not. Supplications. And so when you are praying to God, or even when you are doing supplications, you ought not be what? Y'all forgot already. Exalting yourself. That ain't a prayer, basically, is what God, that, that is, you exalting yourself is not a prayer. It ain't even a praise report. Because a praise report is what you, when you're talking about, and you're thanking God for what God has done. You exalting yourself is you talking about what you have done. All right? We, got, we good on that? We good on that. All right. Thank God. So do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king and do not stand in the place of the great. Why? For it is better that he say to you, come up. So, 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 in this, 
in this text. Do, do, not, do, not, do not stand in the place of the great. Do not stand in the place of the great. Um, thank you, Holy Ghost. Um, college campuses, mostly HBCUs, Morgan State, um, Tuskegee, North Carolina a and other places, they, 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 they have these things called um, stones, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, I think they call it stones. I went to a PWI, so y'all help me out on that. But I'm from Tuskegee. And, and every Greek organization had their own stone, right? Their Greek letter organization etched in stone. And if you were not a part of that, you couldn't stand or be on that. I'll make it even easier for you. Uh, football. Um, Dallas Cowboys. And the center of their stadium is what? A star. The highest sign of disrespect is for what? The opposing team to stand on the star. I don't know who's a Cowboy fan in here. But that's, that's, that's only a place for the Cowboys, of the Ravens uh, on the, in the center field, in the 50-yard in the line. Only, and if you do stand there, that is a sign of what? Great disrespect. Like, you can really get hurt for doing that. And in Alabama, Auburn has these trees. Um, these trees, I believe they were magnolias or something. And at the end of every game, when Auburn would win, I hate Auburn, by the way, um, they would roll the trees in Tuma's Corner with tissue. Just disgusting. They would take toilet tissue and throw them and roll them on the trees. But one day, this man, Alabama fan, um, he proceeds to poison I heard about it on ESPN. Poison the trees. Yeah. And he, nobody knew about it. He called into, y'all heard of Paul Feinbaum? It's a sports show. He called into the Paul Feinbaum show. And after Auburn had just beat Alabama, you know I'm an Alabama fan. And he said, yeah, I know y'all celebrating the game. Y'all beat Alabama, but I want y'all to know something. And Paul Feinbaum said, what is that? He said, in a couple of days, those trees are going to be dead. And he said, how do you know the tree's going to be dead? He said, because I put some poison in the root of the trees. And the man, and Paul Feinbaum says, you can, you can, look, up, you can look it up, it's on YouTube. Paul Feinbaum said, I'm pretty sure that's a crime. <laughs> <laughs> and the man said, it probably is. But they're going to not see those trees anymore. And the man was right. He desecrated the trees. And the man got prison time for trees. Right? And so... Going back to this text, when, and I'm not definitely saying that the Auburn trees are great, but when you are in the midst of what people presume is greatness, you ought not stand there unless you are invited. You ought not stand there unless you are invited. You ought not, and I've, I've been a preacher um, now for some years, and the older I get, the less I want to say how many years. Um, but it's been some years, longer than I've been married, longer than the boy's been born. Um, I've been a preacher. I've been a preacher for some years. Um, and never, ever, in a million years, Reverend Davis, and I could be invited to be the preacher, do I go into anybody's, what, pulpit, Unless I'm what? And my name on the program. My name is on the program as the guest preacher. I would sit down in the audience, especially when I first started preaching and didn't nobody know what I looked like. And they were like, has the preacher showed up yet? Because I thought he was going to be an older man. And, but I would sit there because my dad always told me this scripture. Better to be asked up than asked down. And so I don't care where you are, and I don't care if it's doing service or not. You don't play in the pulpit of a church. You don't play. That's, that's not a place for children to run around in and run around the altar and play hide and go seek. That is not the place for that. 
And I'll tell you something else, because there's Holy Ghost power in the pool pit. You mess around and play in the pool pit you want to. Like your pastor, you two, and 15 years later, you end up being a preacher. <laughs> so be careful running around and when, the, when everybody, when you think everybody's gone and your mama is in the kitchen and your dad's in the finance room with the finance committee and you think you're in the church by yourself. So what I do is I go up there and I go in the pulpit, Sister Winston, because the pulpit had the best chairs in the church. Always has the biggest chairs, the most comfortable chairs. So I'm up there in person chapel, Edmund Church in Midway, Alabama, by myself. And I go and sit, and I ain't sit in a side chair, Sister Wilson. I sit in the big chair where the pastor sits. And I just sit back there, I'm like, oh, wait. This chair feels good. And as soon as I heard a, a, a crack of a door open, I speak on, oh, because my, my dad would beat my behind if he saw me sitting in the pool. And the same thing goes with after the service is over with. Because y'all don't do it here, but in most places, um, after the service is over with, what we have? Dinner. We cook. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Because a lot of times, wasn't no restaurant across the street. There wasn't no Dunkin' Donuts up the road. And everything is closed anyway, if it was there. And you better not sit at the head table. Their food is already laid. Sister Goodwin, food already on the table. They got, they can choose whatever they want to choose. I had to get in line. And, the food, and nobody at the table. So I'm like, you know, it took me one time, Sister Tia, because I, the, at, our, at my home church, the, the table, the head table was right by the pastor's office, and the pastor's office was right by the bathroom. So I'm going to the church, wash my hands. I'm nine, 10 years old, and I see, I see this spread, and I've been in church for three hours, because we had to go to Sunday school. My daddy was a Sunday school superintendent. Grandmama was a Sunday school teacher. Lord bless her soul. I've been in church since 8 o'clock. It's now 12, 30, 1 o'clock, Sister Linda. I'm hungry. That little communion juice didn't do anything for me. And I passed by this table with all this mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese and, I mean, collard greens. And, I mean, you could, it was so good, you could smell it in service. And I had to sit with my daddy in the amen's corner every Sunday. He made me sit next to him. And so I, I proceed, I see an open seat. Pastor still in his office. I see an open seat, Sister Danielle. And I sit down. And I don't know what it was about me, but I always end up sitting in the pastor's seat. It was at the head of the table. It was closer to me. So I was like, sit down. And Lord have mercy. Every studess, every usher, every woman in the kitchen, except my mama, because she was still cooking. She had her back turned to me, thank God. But Robert, they called me Lil Robert because my daddy was big Robert. Um, uh, and I, he's 5'11", and I'm 6'5", ain't that something? Um, get out that seat. Get out that chair. And I learned then it is always better. To be, and what we, what we had a nice pastor. He, when, once, once he found out what was going on, because ain't nobody ever filled up his table because people didn't like talking to the pastor back then either. Um, he would always invite me to come back and sit at his table. Just not in his seat. <laughs> so he was Reverend Randolph, was a real, real nice man. And so when you see texts like this, when you see texts like this, don't do, do not stand in the place of the great. Don't, 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 don't just automatically assume that you can be in 
these folk presence. Don't, don't exalt yourself, first of all, in their presence. So we talked about what that means for God. But when you meet, say you meet um, um, the president, say you meet the senator, that's not the time for you to exalt yourself. That got on my nerves. I'm going to get back to the sitting in the place, too, in a minute. When, when, I was, when I was in Tulsa and when I would be bringing people around, you know, folks like Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, and uh, 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 Michael Bloomberg and everybody, it, everybody kind of, you know, and I get it, they were shocked to meet them, um, but people kind of felt like they had to impress the folk, right? Well, you know, I'm this, and I'm that, and I'm like, I don't ask you. <laughs> And people feel like Reverend Breckenridge, because of who they say they are, you got to bring them inside. But I'm like, these people didn't invite you. You know? So you, we, we should not feel like we have to exalt ourselves in front of folk we think are great. Because I promise you, if you're that great, they already know about you. They already know about you. Um, and in this text, the next part it says was, and do not stand in the place of the great. When you see places of prominence, when you see places of prominence and people in position of prominence, it's, it's, it's fine to, to see them, but don't feel like you automatically have VIP access. I don't care how well you know them. Uncle, how well you know him? And we, 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 we've had some important people here. We're going to have some more important people here. And I need you to know, just because folk don't sit down and dine with you don't mean they don't fool with you, but sometimes folk just need a break. They need, they need a break. They need a break. They need, I need a break sometimes. Sometimes I don't have anybody back there. I just want to eat by myself because I eat a little aggressively. And I don't want everybody seeing how I eat. Nothing against you. But I'm still, I can't, I can't, I'm still learning how to pull my crab claws. Right? I don't want you seeing me fumbling through crab claws and lobster. I don't, I don't need you to see that. Right? And so, and so give people a chance to invite you up. Versus automatically coming in. You, you, you've, you've seen that, you've had that neighbor, that bro man from the fifth floor, that you don't even invite in your house, but because you open the door to say who is it, they feel like that was their invitation to come in your house. And you have to find a nice, nasty way a uh, passive-aggressive way uh, in Baltimore. Y'all don't do anything passively. Y'all just say, get out of my house. <laughs> you know. Um, because I didn't call for you. You know? You, 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 somebody, somebody, somebody coming over, you watching the game, and say, what you doing watching the game? Let's, what, what's on TV? Let's watch it. I didn't call you to come over to my house to watch the game. And that's why sometimes people don't answer your phone calls. Because they know if they tell you, if you tell them you're at home and you're doing something, guess what you're going to get in the next five minutes? And then they get mad if what? If you don't answer the door. But the Bible said, you can quote them Proverbs 25, verse 6. Do not stand in the place of the great. Don't come to my house. If I didn't invite you, don't come to my office if you don't have a what? An invitation or appointment. For it is, I know he in there. Yeah, I am in here. For it is better that he say to you, come on up. Then what? Put the scripture back up there. I don't think I'm making this up. It is better for him to say, come up here, then what? Then that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince. And see, then when you get put out, 
Guess who the bad person is? Pastor, I'll be ashamed himself. Oh, uh, no, nah, Troy, because I ain't going to do it. I'm going to have a Troy and Mike do it in Pernell. Who they think they all put me out? I put this here together. I'm, I'm such and so. Better to be asked of. Oh, the Bible says better to be asked of than to be asked to go lower. I didn't say lower. The Bible said then to be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. So the first time the prince sees you is that you being kicked out of the backstage of the VIP room because you went somewhere that you had no business being. And instead of the prince saying, hey, who was such and so? Bring them back here. The prince is watching you being escorted out by security. Because you couldn't wait. I'm going to preach that one day. Knowing how to wait for the invitation. And sometimes you miss your own banquet. Because you could not wait for your invitation. Your name is being written as we speak. But because you're so thirsty, because you're so self-righteous, you felt entitled to a seat at the table that at that moment didn't have your name on it. But you know how great you are. You know how great you are. You know you deserve a seat at the table. And guess what? You probably do. But let somebody recognize your worth first. And sometimes that means they may have to miss you in order to send for you. Ooh. Mm, Y'all got that? Y'all got that? Sometimes there are people in your life that have to miss you in order to send for you. But because you were always there, or trying to get there, they like, I really ain't sending for them. And your seat is there, but at that moment, your name hasn't made it on there. All right, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. Because and notice the progression, and notice the progression, notice the progression. But last week we talked about removing draws from silver, um, removing weakness from around you, and, and those folks who, um, um, and, and removing the wicked from the king's presence, and his throne will be established forever. And don't boast about yourself before the king. That's the first part. Don't exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Don't try to brag about yourself to get your name on the invite list. Y'all hear what I just said? Let other folk brag about you. And sometimes, sometimes people that you think don't care or don't know anything about you, those are the ones who brag on you the most. They do. But they don't do it in your presence because they don't want you to get the big head. I'm going to say this and I'm going to go back to this text because it's very uh, relevant. I was in college. I was in college, Sister Setsa, when I realized that my daddy bragged about me. You hear what I'm saying? I've been in church with this man for 18 years. Only man I ever lived with, besides my frat brothers. And I never once, ever once, ever once heard him publicly commend me for anything. Ever. Ever. 
mother. Right? My son did a good job. None of that. My son made the honor roll. None of that. My son made the paper. None of that. In my presence. And I would hear him brag about other kids at church. I'm like, I did the same thing. I did more than they did. They ain't never said anything. When I say anything, I'm not, I'm not talking up about it. You know, I'm, it's okay now. I'm, just, I'm a big man. I'm, I'm 40 years old now. I'm, I don't worry about it at all anymore. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I was in college. And a friend of my daddy's. I came back home because I, 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 I was not one of those students that came home every holiday. I was enjoying college. I didn't come home unless I just had to do some laundry and my girlfriends and my female friends were going back home. Because my frat brother's laundry, I would not use their room at all. It was so filthy. Um, I wasn't married then, you know, just so y'all won't be trying to put timelines together. And so, and so, I came home very sparingly. And I was around, go back home and I see some of my dad's friends and it was like, Man, your dad always talking about you. I'm like, who? <laughs> who, who daddy? <laughs> no, I mean, every time I look around, he's talking about what you're doing in Tuskegee, Alabama, and doing this, doing... I'm like, who daddy? He said, your name Robert Turner, I'm trying to say, yeah, your daddy Robert Turner, yeah. Your daddy are always bragging about you. And I talked to my mom about it. She said, yeah, baby, you've been doing it all your life. I said, oh, who like? <laughs> I said, y'all got it. Y'all punking me. She said, no, Rob, but your daddy, your daddy brags about you all the time. He just don't do it in front of your presence. I like, why not? I want to hear it. He said, because your daddy wants you to stay humble, son. I'm like, I didn't want to tell you what I said after that, but sometimes, sometimes the people that tell you the most behind your back talk about you the worst. Sometimes the folk that you don't hear anything good from about you be the main ones, your biggest cheerleaders, right? And so, you don't have to exalt yourself at all. Because the people that know you already know. And people that don't know you, they'll find out. If they don't, who cares? Because you, you, you shouldn't do your resume. When you built your resume from 0 to 35 or 0 to 45 or 0 to 55, you should not have built your resume so somebody you met two weeks ago can be impressed with you. You know what I'm saying? You didn't go through high school or the college. You didn't commit yourself to further studies for somebody you meet at a bar to buy you another drink. Right? Or for some man to hold you in high regard. Or for some woman to want you to be her baby daddy. Then you got more problems than you want. <laughs> you, 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 you should not have, now some people do, but you should not have done all the hard work that you've done so somebody can pat you on the back. You shouldn't have. You should have done it. And sometimes we don't get the exaltation from man because we did the stuff for the wrong reasons. Because you should have done it for God's glory. That's it. I mean, I hate to be a spoiler. I hate to give you the cliff notes before the end. But the whole purpose of your life is not to get trophies or plaques a holiday is in your name. The purpose of your life is to give God glory. That's it. That God receives glory 
for your life. Because I promise you, when folk start exalting you, you better watch out. We have a song. Don't exalt the preacher. Don't exalt the pew. Preach the gospel simple, full, and free. For I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Lift him up. Everything about your life ought to be not for your dad and say, good job, son. I mean, as a child, you may need that. I get it. But you ain't got to have it. You ain't got to have it. It should be. And sometimes God withholds things from us so that we can do them for the right reason. So I made all A's because I wanted to. Well, I made stuff, did stuff in the community because I wanted to. My parents found out about it, great. If they didn't, it's all right because it was for God's glory. If I make the paper or not, it's fine. God knows. For God's glory. If I, if I get credit for stuff I did in Tulsa, wonderful if I don't, it's all right. Folk gonna lie about you when you leave anyway. Because guess what? What I did was all for God's glory. If I die tonight, I know today I'm the best preacher in Baltimore. If I die tonight, the next preacher call me the best preacher in Baltimore. It don't matter. Because everything that God has given me to do I ain't been perfect in it, but I tried to do it to God's glory. And that's how your life ought to be. You, you can be fired tomorrow. Your, your, rec, your, your evaluation can be all ones. Now I want to fight somebody now. <laughs> I ain't never got a one in my life. <laughs> I'm going to put this in my personnel file. I'm going to write a response to this. I'm going to have a, have a hearing my union boss, Mr. Troy Tigno. You ain't going to show me I'm going to get ones. But it doesn't matter what's in your personnel file. I mean, it re- I promise you, when God calls your name when you die, do you think he's going to quote from your personnel file? Now, unless you did some stuff, now I'm just... <laughs> But it should be all of his glory. And so... Verse 8, verse 8, verse 8 talks to us even more so about how, 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 how when we get into it with people because we want to get stuff. We want, we want to sit at the head table. We want to get all the credit. We want to get all the exaltations. And when we don't, we want to, we want to sue somebody. What, is, what does verse 8 say? Do not go hastily to the court. To court. For what would you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? Now, the Bible doesn't say you don't go to court. But the Bible says don't go hastily. To it. Sometimes the court of law is necessary, but it should not be the first resort for men and women of God. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And the New Testament talks about that too, how Christians ought not be suing each other in the court. Why? We, what, what do we look like going to man to solve our disputes when we're supposed to be saved, right? We're supposed to be saved. We're supposed to be saved. We are supposed to be saved. But we have to do everything. I'm a, we, when I was growing up, we had a, a song, Take That Stuff to Trial, man. It was trap music. Y'all shouldn't know what that is anyway, so thank God y'all don't. But take that stuff to trial. Because we are so hastily to want to go to court. Couples, hastily, want to go to court. Nobody want to talk anything out anymore. Y'all getting quiet on me now, that's fine. When you get into a dispute with somebody, you hastily want to take folk to court. If folk were really saved, we wouldn't have a backlog in our judicial system. Because we will believe in talking to people first. Now, if you can't talk to folk, then you got to do what you got to do. But Christians ought be able to take the personal approach before we take the professional approach. Because the Christians all, all have the same common denominator. And that's Jesus the Christ. 
That's that's that should be who we are. That that should be who we are. Otherwise, what does the Bible say? Your neighbor has put you to shame. When your neighbor, what will your end, what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? Because trust, trust this now, if you go to court, somebody's business is going to be put out there. That's why the Bible says, why go to court so quickly? For what will you do in the end it's all, it's not pastor turn talk, it's about this word of God talking. For what would you do in the end when your neighbor has put you? That's not an if, church. That's not a maybe, church. That's when. Even if you win the case, I've never seen anybody, the plaintiff nor the defendant, go to court and come out unscathed. Because these attorneys, they find out what you made on your kindergarten test. They're going to dig up every dream you've had. So it's better to not go to court. But even now, the court system recognizes you settling. In fact, every person who has a cell phone, we all do, because y'all call me on it. When you sign your cell phone contract, you have signed away your right to take them to court. You know that? They say you must handle this by arbitration. Most major companies, now they ain't seen you in no courtroom. Courtroom is unpredictable. You can take a jury and if you got a good lawyer or a good case, you can go from not owing them $1,000 on them to owing them a million dollars. Or you can have the best case in the world and not get a penny. That's why I say, well, you know, let's just try to settle this out of court. Let's keep these documents, y'all know the word, sealed. Because you don't want nobody hearing about this, and I don't either. <laughs> so let's just handle this like adults. You know, and the Bible recognizes that they said, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor? Because it's not a maybe. Somebody, both of you going to be embarrassed by what is said or done in these court proceedings. What does the Bible tell you to do? Debate your case with your neighbor. Not in the courtroom, but with your neighbor. And then, what does the Bible say? And do not disclose. Ain't that something? What if we just follow the word of God? So when you are debating with your neighbor, they should not have to worry about, even if they are your adversary, they should not have to worry about what? You sharing what was said to another. And I like how the Bible just said another. That's, that's, that's another person that's not in this conversation. I don't care who it is, your mama, your brothers. To, don't, don't share these secrets to a another. I don't care who it is. The children don't need to know. Mama, daddy, uncle, auntie. If they're not a part of this direct conversation, they don't need to know. And that's biblical. Lest he who hears, what the Bible gives you the consequences. What does it say? Lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation be ruined. Because I promise you this, Maybe the same, my, my dad told me this a long time ago, the same finger that's pointing out has one, three more pointing back at you. 
The same hand. You point, you did this, and you said that, and you are this, and you are that. What, what is God showing you by your own pointing? And the same person you point to got at least, for every one thing you got against them, they can say at least three things about you. So don't take it to court. Talk in person, debate in person. And the Bible didn't even say y'all going to agree. That's why it says debate your case because y'all ain't going to probably come to a consensus. But debate your case with your neighbor and don't share the secret to another lest you'll you be put to shame and your reputation. But she was at fault. Uh, he did it wrong. I promise you, somewhere in that conversation, something came out that you did that was bad. And if you don't want that getting out, you keep what they did in to yourself. Because, and most wise people know, most wise people know, two perfect folk not going to separate. And two perfect people don't exist. <laughs> so, there's plenty of blame. So don't you be listening to these folk when they saying that, yeah, girl, you ain't do nothing wrong. As soon as you leave that table, as soon as you leave that chair, Child, she was so terrible to deal with. I see why he left. <laughs> and vice versa. Man, yeah, you sure had a point, man. That was wrong. She, and as soon as you leave, hey, now what's her number again? <laughs> Fuck ain't worth a quarter. But so the Bible teaches, if you got something against somebody, you take it up to them. And when y'all finish talking, you leave it alone. And you do what you got to do. That is Proverbs Conflict Management 101. Well before any law book was written, God was teaching us how to handle our conflict. And it's amazing the wisdom and brilliance of God that the same concepts and attributes and principles that he has in our Bible, the best arbiters, the best conflict managers, the best life coaches give you basically the same advice. Give you the same advice. Give you the exact same if I don't go to the court unless you want it public because every court document is public record. Unless you are minor and they conceal it for you. But every public, every court document is public record. So if you don't want it the public to know about it, don't go to the court. Because as soon as you go to the court, it's known. It's known. It's known. And the best way of keeping a secret is not telling anybody. Because <laughs> I promise you, I know, he, oh, child, I ain't going to tell nobody. They lying. They telling somebody. They, they, you, you, people are not designed to hold anything. The first two people, Adam and Eve, they ain't have but each other. They ratted on each other to God. You know the story. Eve ratted on the snake. Adam ratted on Eve. And they didn't have but each other. We don't know how to keep stuff to ourselves. This is in our nature to tell. The best way of keeping folk from telling something is don't tell them. <laughs> Just don't tell them. Don't even worry about thinking of who you can trust or not. Just don't tell them. We on a need to know basis. And you don't need to know. 
unless you already know. <laughs> so God is trying to teach you some wisdom. Proverbs is the book of wisdom. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. I know y'all will still tell your business because that's what we do, but at least you can't have an excuse saying you don't know because the word of God has already told you. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father, we thank you. We praise you. We lift you up now because you are worthy. Um, you are so good to us in spite of us. You teach us how to handle conflict. You, you teach us how to handle all of our problems. We pray that you bless us, oh God, to be better in handling our conflicts and handling all of our problems. Bless the offering that we're taking up on tonight. Bless those who are giving on Cash App or Givelify. Bless Cash App at Dollar Sign ET Power. God, keep us in our prayer life to not exalt ourselves, uh, but to exalt you in everything that we do and in every way. Help us to remember that only by your grace and your mercy that we're able to do anything. And God, give us the humility to not assume a seat at the table, but to be asked up versus to be asked down. And help us, oh God, if we ever have any conflict with any man or woman that we seek to debate with our neighbor first privately and not share another secret. Uh, we thank you for this wisdom. We praise you that you bless this offering and bless us as we travel home until we meet again on Sunday morning for Sunday school and our worship service at the most powerful place on the planet, 4217 Primrose Avenue. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We ask the officers to come now as we give and we thank God for those who are watching. Um, we ask them to come and so we bless God and I'll give him.